Right, well, Penhan Dahi Gate, a Croeso, Ear Session Ola and a Gabres Hon, are the Wid, a Gwaith, a Delanwad, a Medig, a Loisol, Dr. Julian Tudor Hart. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the last of this series of four events to celebrate the life and the work and the legacy of Dr. Julian Tudor Hart, the GP based in Glyn Corrug in Comarvan who was famous for rethinking the role of a family doctor. And in, uh, in case you missed uh, any of the first three talks in this series, then uh, all of them are available uh, for you to look at on the uh, Royal Institution of South Wales YouTube site. If you just put Royal Institution of South Wales and YouTube in Google, you'll find them. Today's speaker is uh, Professor George Davies Smith, and we're very, very grateful uh, to you, George, for joining us today. I know you're an extremely busy person. And as evidence for that, I'm just going to introduce uh, George. He's been Professor of Clinical Epidemiology at the University of Bristol since 1994. He's also Honorary Professor of Public Health at the University of Glasgow and Visiting Professor at the London School of Tropical Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, in 2014, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society uh, of Edinburgh, and he has also many other honours. His research is concentrated on finding ways of improving causal inference in studies of disease and disease prevention. And throughout his career, he's promoted increasing the accessibility of data. One of the major studies he led was the Avon uh, Longitudinal Study of Parents and Their Children, and he studied his, he's written widely, published widely on uh, all kinds of issues connected with health inequality and poverty. Uh, I should also say, um, I don't know if you will mind me saying this, uh, that he lists among his rec uh, recreations, I quote, poor squash, bad tennis and abysmal badminton. And I can only sympathize. Um, George's theme is Julian's early formulation of the inverse uh, care law. And I'll just quote you from um, Julian's original article in The Lancet in 1971. Um, the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it in the population served. This inverse care law operates more completely where medical care is most exposed to market forces and less so when such exposure is reduced. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to you, George. Thanks very much. It was a real honour to be invited to do this. Uh, I'm, uh, well, I'm not going to apologise for the rescheduling. The rescheduling was that my colleagues are on strike and uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm not in the University College Union, I'm in the Unite, um, but uh, uh, the, the notion of the digital picket has now been, uh, has been put forward correctly and the, the date that I was supposed to speak was a strike date and I would have been crossing the uh, digital picket and I realised that I know what Julian uh, would have correctly uh, thought about that so I'm um, sorry to have to have to have the, the, you know, the programme was uh, moved about but uh, thank you very much for doing so and still um, and still allowing me to talk because it is a genuine uh, honour uh, honor to um, talk about Julian uh, and it's fantastic to see uh, Mary uh, uh, here. So my uh, brief was to talk about uh, the uh, inverse care law, and, I'm going to, and we've had three fantastic uh, talks already on this uh, in this series um, that I'd like. Uh, I'd highly recommend the video. The YouTube videos are, are available from uh, Brian Gibbons, uh, from uh, Jonathan Richards and Gareth Jones, and uh, last week from Graham Watt. Uh, and uh, in all three. Uh, all three of those talks, the, the speakers all mentioned uh, Julia's, Julian's uh, aversion to the ivory tower that, um, and that you know, moving into the ivory tower of, uh, of academia without being linked to uh, practice was a way of sort of moving um, to, uh, to irrelevance. Um, so I guess I'm the sort of representative uh, of the uh, ivory tower in this, uh, in this, in this series of talks. And uh, I first heard about the, the inverse care law from Julian's uh, good friend, uh, Ronnie Frankenberg, when I was a medical student. Uh, I lived with uh, one of Ronnie's uh, 
uh, daughters and uh, when we're in Italy with Ronnie, uh, he's, he's, he was telling me, told me about, didn't I know this um, paper, the inverse care law paper, I think it was on the Black Report, it just come out, just come out and I just sort of seen a copy of that. Um, and, at the, and at the time, uh, Ronnie uh, <laughs> said the same as Graham did, Graham Watt did uh, last week, and that Julian had, you know, more lately said to me, more lately said to me, which was that he was in some ways embarrassed about, the, you know, about the sort of fame of the inverse care law uh, paper because, it, you know, what it what it did was brilliantly put together um, material that, you know, as Julian said, was was widely was sort of widely known, but uh, possibly not uh, actually dealt, uh, you know, dealt with, and he put it into a framework that with that the name the inverse care law reflecting Newton's uh, inverse square law uh, a name that would uh, would become a slogan and therefore the sloganizing actually uh, you know has effects um yeah so Ronnie had said said the um said the same when I first was introduced to it and but I'm uh, reading it it was such a compelling uh, presentation uh, and that its impact is definitely uh, was definitely de uh, depended on its compelling, uh, on, uh, on its compelling nature. Anyway, uh, Ronnie, by the, if people in Wales interested, Ronnie's book, Village on the Border, the, uh, 1957 ethnography, probably the first uh, ethnography treating a, a, a British uh, community uh, as the target of the ethnographer, which Ronnie had to do because he wasn't allowed to travel to the Caribbean where he intended to do his PhD because of his Communist Party membership. Uh, it's, it's just a brilliant read, in my view. And uh, as a medical student, I, my sort of outlook on life, medical student, socialist medical student, was driven really by four uh, books that I'd read over that period. One was uh, Archie Cochrane's Effectiveness and Efficiency, which promoted randomised controlled trials, but, but really promoted the idea that you needed to have a valuation of whether medical care was working to actually then want to invest in it. Or, you know, you the uh, health service investment should be in things that actually worked and improved uh, health. So wanting more rigorous evaluation. The second was Thomas McEwan's um, role of medicine, a uh, famous uh, polemic, which was sort of which stated that medicine had made very little contribution to the um, large declines in mortality that happened from birth cohorts from 1850 uh, onwards, and they were sort of arrested in the 1930s. Uh, those those huge declines, except for infant mortality, which carried on declining. But uh, and um, his that was the copy I read or the version I read, uh, the, the popular paperback. And um, uh, you know he said the, in order of importance the determinants of health were nutritional, environmental, and behavioural in the past, and will probably be behavioural, environmental, and nutritional in the future, at least in developed countries. So he was making a sort of statement about the future, not just even though he's basing what he said on historical um, uh, data. This was one of the this is one of the uh, uh, parts of what I'd learnt that Julian uh, disabuse was uh, disabused um, me of. That isn't meant to be there, sorry. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, other, the next was uh, Leslie Doyle's 1979 Pluto press book, The Political Economy of Health, uh, um, which, which was a groundbreaking uh, approach to thinking of health as being, uh, you know, as being uh, produced and not only produced through uh, health, health services. And then finally, of course, the Black Report on Inequality in Health, which came out in 19, 1980, and like, most people, uh, one only could get to read it in a in a very well edited form in 1982 when it, when Penguin Books brought out a popular uh, copy of it. And with it, with this uh, sort of arm, uh, being armed um, by the by these sort of uh, inputs, after doing um, junior hospital jobs, I came to Wales in early 1985 to take up. Uh, uh, epidemiological job with a, a newly founded health promotion program in Wales called Heartbeat Wales, but then with a link to, and then I moved to the MRC epidemiology unit in South Wales, which, which Archie Cochrane was 
still sitting in the top room of, even though it was being run by uh, Peter Elwood and where Julian had worked in, 19, uh, in about 1961 for only a year. Um, when Julian wrote about the three most important papers that had influenced his practice, and he, he mentioned also two books, and one of them was by my, uh, again, my mentor, um, Jerry Morris, The Uses of Epidemiology, uh, indicating you know, the, the importance of actually thinking epidemiologically in even you know, in considering how clinical practice should be organized, evaluated, and how its future should look. And um, I, I think beautifully, his second book, of course, was, was a very practical book on medical records, medical education, and patient care by Lawrence Weed, which I think had been um, you know, led to the famous uh, card indexes and uh, notes uh, system, free computer that uh, was established in Glencora and fed into what the, think the work I'll go on to talk about with you know, the high response rate uh, work uh, involving uh, involving assessment of the whole practice uh, population. So I met Julian uh, at this uh, time, and uh, he told me uh, after the uh, it was fantastic uh, meeting him, and he told but and he told me that as a socialist and someone who was an epidemiologist, I couldn't. Uh, just just work in epidemiology as a full time sort of epidemiological researcher, and that I had to come and work in his uh, practice. And, this was, and therefore, you know, you'd, therefore you would join theory and practice could be uh, linked together. And I did uh, take. I thought about this a lot, and uh, um, for, as, as 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 of course you would in that way. Uh, and uh, for, I'll, I'll come back to the I'll come back to that conversation at the end of the at the end of the talk, but um, maybe part of um, part of the reasons for this was Julian's own experience in the medical in the MRC unit where in 1961 where he'd found as he says the people were weird he said this in a witness seminar uh, about the the unit um, about the MRC unit that was carried about when about twenty. Five years ago, I think now Mary was at, uh, as well as one of the witnesses, uh, and um, uh, Julian said at this witness seminar there was within the unit quite a lot of reciprocated hostility to clinicians. I don't think it was just personalities. I think it was that the uh, the pneumoconiosis research unit people were becoming more clinical, and actually had people on the wards and so on. Archie could be very scathing about clinicians. Sometimes I think excessively so, and that was one of the reasons. Uh, one of the reasons I left. And of course, we've heard in these last the three previous talks, we've heard in very considerable detail about the amazing work and important work that uh, Julian with Mary then went on uh, to do in Glencora. So that was uh, 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 Julian. I think forgave me for, for, for the fact that I did indeed stick in the. Um, Ivory Tower. So uh, we've already uh, heard uh, from Andrew the uh, brilliant uh, summary uh, of the inverse care law paper, the paper that came out in 1971 uh, in the Lancet. So I won't uh, read it out again. But you know, it's so it's it's such a beautiful compression. That, you know, finishing not just stating the facts of the law, that the law is driven by market forces, uh, and that this is a primitive form of, and uh, hopefully seem to be transgressed, uh, trans, uh, to be moved beyond form of organisation. Uh, uh, and uh, one thing maybe the other talk, the other speakers of uh, this series have also brought out, brought up is what brilliant writer Julian was. I mean, he's a, a pleasure to read his prose. I remember him, he did say to me that, you know, he thought you were asking a lot for people to actually spend their time reading, you know, semi-academic or semi-academic uh, writing when they could be reading something more enjoyable. Um, so you should at least, you know, attempt to be not, not to have the sort of bloated, uh, self-important prose of the, of academic writing. And I think he lived up to that um, uh, brilliantly. So we have the inverse care law, and as I say, I'm, 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 I'm going to examine a couple of uh, aspects of this. 
but uh, Julian very much liked the notion of the, the, the notion that uh, Mary Shaw and Danny Dawling uh, and, and others since have, have discussed about the positive care law, which is actually looking at care provided by people as opposed to by the state and the role of uh, the, the role of how much care is provided by family, friends, other form, other support networks, you know, other forms of, of care than than uh, than um, simply NHS and state funded care, and that there, when when it's sort of self organised, that there is a, there's a positive relationship between the care and the need uh, that it that, that that exists, and uh, Julian. Um, uh, wrote an editorial about that and he said uh, all too often kind words about the inverse care law are an apology for continued capitulation cowardice and avarice Shaw and Dawling present a much more important and challenging idea that organization of medical care should become as rational as what patients and their families friends and neighbors have already achieved for informal care the inverse care law will then become a footnote to history, scarcely credible to our more civilized descendants. And um, the you know inverse care law has been uh, uh, has been looked at in relation to virtually everything you can think uh, possible. The term has been used in many cases. Here's a you know we just look at this, this these this, these regression lines, the correlation coefficient of minus 0.441. Uh, uh, and what you see is as the percent of deprived households get less and less, this uh, this form of <laughs> this form of distribution becomes worse, and people get less and less of it. This might might have been one uh, a form of care that uh, Julian might not have been that upset about being distributed in this way, which is the number of clergy per ten thousand people. And this is for from a paper which looks at. Uh, <laughs> Clergy and, the, and also being another example of uh, the inverse and the inverse care law. So I, again, we've heard from the previous uh, talks the celebration of the inverse care law fifty years after it appeared, which is also um, the, the purpose of this of this whole this, this series of talks. So it's appropriately so, and the Lancet. Um, had a whole series of uh, pieces on this, including Andy Haynes writing about the inverse care law and global warming and uh, climate change, uh, and um, editorials and commentaries about the importance of the inverse care law and potential primary care in deprived areas, and a very thorough review of the inverse care law re examined the global perspective. And the uh, Health Foundation have also brought out an excellent report on tackling the inverse care law. And I think these, these resources you know, provide scholarly and very well uh, researched way into uh, the work which has, uh, which has followed on. But uh, uh, as I mentioned, and as Graham uh, mentioned and others have said, and Ronnie actually said to me, as I say, when I first, when I first heard of the inverse care law, uh, that Sir Julian didn't, Julian didn't see this as his primary achievement, even though the meme that he introduced has been so important uh, and might not have uh, wanted to have uh, the, the, his introduction of the concept of the inverse care law uh, in the BMJ obituary might rather have had uh, how he then tried to put together an exemplar of how what things you can do to try and um, to, to actually uh, try and redistribute resources and lead to optimal care uh, for all uh, with Mary and in Glen Corrib. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the context in which it was introduced, which I think might be surprising, and then I'm going to talk about how uh, uh, Julian generalised this notion of the inverse care law to two uh, issues. One is response rates in studies. Uh, and how, how this applies there. And then the second one was to thinking of, about overall level of risk and how medical care has most to, to give and the, the benefits are, are greatest uh, for individuals and groups at the highest level of risk. So I'm gonna talk about those, just two particular uh, issues. So first, 
is the uh, context. So the paper appeared in 1971, and 1971 was uh, was in a, in a brief period where the all-cause mortality rates and mortality rates from from some for some conditions of cardiovascular um, disease in particular uh, was highest and and basically had not, had changed very little since the 19, uh, 1930s. And McEwen writing about the decline in mortality um, across the end of the 19th century, beginning and the first part of the 20th century, when this occurred, when tuberculosis fell, rheumatic heart disease fell, um, diseases of uh, malnutrition uh, fell, uh, stomach cancer uh, declined, and, but for, for reasons that people at that time didn't know, although it was because of um, the fall in Helicobacter pylori infection acquired in childhood, almost uh, very likely. Uh, you know, there were these large improvements in mortality, and then against those, in, in men uh, especially, there was then this, a big rise in coronary heart disease, big rise in, um, in lung cancer, a rise in peptic ulcer, which didn't kill quite as many, which led to the stagnation of, of um, overall uh, mortality. The, the reason that life expectancy carried on increasing was purely down to the fact that infant mortality declined and carried on uh, declining. So 1971, you know, population health, if you're looking at middle-aged and older uh, populations as in a mining uh, community, it, it, it didn't look as though things were going moving in the right direction. There was, a, you know, there was both you know, inequality and just overall high levels of morbidity and uh, mortality. So on this picture on the left, we, uh, we see for all circulatory disease at the top, this is in men, then for ischemic heart disease, the black line, um, uh, and uh, oh, then for respiratory disease, which, which was uh, still showing some decline, but the, but the overall pattern was not, was not good, what was happening in men in, in particular. In women, uh, in fact, really interestingly, you know, coronary heart disease had already started to decline, started to decline way before men. And this was at a time, this was when women um, took up smoking, you know, the, the big increase in female smoking was a cohort, was, an, was a, sorry, an effect of the Second World War in the way the big increase of male smoking, so cigarette smoking, which is the most harmful form, as opposed to pipe, cigar type uh, smoking, was in the First World War. But uh, despite that, uh, uh, for women, uh, there was uh, there, um, there was improvement. Uh, uh, not so much. So that was the context in overall health. The overall population health was um, was poor and was not showing signs uh, of improvement. So then the context of, of inequalities is it, it, it is interesting. Uh, oh, sorry, I just finished that off. This is, and this is just showing that those improvements, this is a slide uh, Danny Dawling uh, uh, kindly get, lent me, uh, or gave me, I guess, you know, I'm not going to give it back, but anyway, this is, this is a slide showing that the improvements uh, in, in life expectancy are, are continuing and have been really dramatic. I mean, sorry, the degree to which uh, I think is under underappreciated, the, the degree to which from the late 1970s, there was just a turn, there was a turnaround in that stagnant position with coronary heart disease, uh, redu uh, you know, reducing other, many other uh, forms of, uh, of morbidity, mort uh, mortality, especially reducing. And, and, and this is just from just from um, 1982 to 2011, you just see these several years of life uh, added, you know, just sort of six or six years of life added to a uh, life expectancy. So, the, so of course, the, po the population is just cha changing uh, dramatically in its distribution too, to an older and uh, an older population. And the, uh, the, the thinking about major uh, focus, focuses of you know, health services, which I think would be a good discussion point, is the extent to which mortality, just straightforward mortality redu reduction, the extent to which that is actually, is that the goal of is that the major goal of health 
uh, of health services when we've, had, we've given these absolutely dramatic improvements. So now going back to the uh, context of uh, inequality. So the you know, data which have, tradition, have traditionally been seen to be the strongest uh, data uh, on socioeconomic inequalities in mortality in the United Kingdom come from the Registrar General's decennial supplement. So every 10 years, going back to 1911, the Registrar General has had uh, mortality for working age uh, males coded according to their occupation. The um, wives in the early period coded to the occupation of their husbands and then uh, dual coded uh, more recently. And these supplements are based around the census year because at the census year you have a good denominator. A lot of care is taken to think about how coding anomalies may, uh, may influence um, you know, may, may influence these things. But this is these these were the these were the data available when Julian wrote the paper in 1971. The most recent decennial supplement data available uh, were from the around the 1951 census, which was a, a long time previously. But what had been seen was that the 1951 census had the smallest and least consistent difference, socioeconomic differences in mortality of any decennial supplement. So if, if you from 1911 to now, and you, and you take into account the size of the uh, population groups, so you're not just looking at the sort of extremes, you're taking into account the proportion of people in the different groups, then 1951 was an anomaly. It was an anomaly, you know, the anomaly was that the, these the differentials were, were small uh, for, for, for mortality. And uh, these are these are the data for um, married women. The uh, I mean the diseases of poverty, like bronchitis, you know, showed major showed large gradients, and you know has large, if not slightly large, if not a bit larger in fifty one than in nineteen thirty one. But um, uh, polio is of course interesting, a disease where delayed infection, which the better off families who are more likely to uh, have infection delayed from early childhood through to later childhood or, or even early adulthood when it is a devastating disease. Uh, it's a disease showing a, a very large excess in the uh, professional uh, classes. But more important than that, of course, because poliomyelitis was a rare cause of death was coronary heart disease. So part of it, a big, a big chunk of the reason uh, for the low, uh, in, the small inequalities in all causes was because there was a, a there was a, uh, there was a, a, an inverse gradient, i.e. the professional uh, classes having the higher rate of coronary heart disease, which wasn't just uh, artifacts of coding. For, mar for married women, this, there was, there was, this was not seen, and this is still one of the, this is not, not explained really, is the fact that uh, women and um, never showed an excess um, in the higher social groups in the in the UK, uh, whereas men showed us quite a, a striking one. And you know, and then here, here just looking at um, lung cancer, this is looking from the 1931 and going forward to the senior supplement based around 1991 uh, data. Uh, in 1931, uh, social class one and five were the uh, highest uh, rates of lung cancer death in men. These, these, are, these are data just for men, but lung cancer was only 1% of all deaths. And then as lung cancer crept up to 12% of all deaths, you started getting the, the stark inequalities. But, but, but in 1951, uh, there was only an excess in the social class five uh, men, the unskilled manual, manual workers. So, 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 you know, somewhat, um, maybe surprisingly, and part of the importance of Julian's paper was, was basically putting social inequality and health on the agenda at a period where there's people have thought, you know, the NHS was going to deal with these issues because, um, you know, because healthcare was uh, such an important uh, perceived 
uh, influence on health outcomes, whereas for something like lung cancer, of course, health services um, uh, at, the, at those stages until they started promoting non-smoking and uh, not smoking uh, offered uh, rather little. And here we here we, here's looking at smoking prevalence. So if you look at about you know even in 1971, the uh, inequalities in the you know the differences in social so in smoking were rather small. And that those data, of course, weren't available. You look back to when the data were available at the time Julian was writing, and uh, did discuss there were rather little the, the social social inequalities in smoking uh, were were small. And here's just here's this, just the summary of the sort of social class. Uh, differences showing how they widened from 1951 uh, to 1961. So the, the decennial supplement for 1961 uh, had been announced uh, to appear that it was going to appear in 68 and then it didn't appear in 69. I think at 69 it was actually said it was formally it was going to going to appear. And, the, and uh, early in the year after he wrote the inverse care law paper. Julian wrote uh, a piece in another piece in the Lancet when the data on occupational mortality for 1959 to 1963 finally appeared too little and too late. And uh, so he, uh, he says that the Registrar General's decennial supplement uh, on the 61 census and, uh, and on mortality data for 59 to 63 was published three years late on December the 23rd, 1971. And many people here will, will know, of, of course, of the story of the Black Report, uh, which was published uh, on an Easter and Monday. Uh, and famously, only this, this Black Report was commissioned under, uh, under Wilson's Labour government and, uh, well, uh, and, and uh, Callahan's, by then, I guess, Labour government. Uh, but by the time it appeared, uh, the, um, the Tories, Thatcher's Tories, had been voted in. The Black Report was, um, was written by Jerry Morris and Peter Townsend, uh, were the two main instigators, well, the two main contributors to actually writing and to the intellectual content of the Black Report. And the Black Report kept, was a very comprehensive um, examination of data on inequalities in mortality based on the decennial supplement from 1971 on data on morbidity from various, well, much of it from general practice surveys. Julian was quoted um, substantially uh, throughout of it, throughout, throughout it uh, looked at the role of inequalities in healthcare and, um, and put together a line which was somewhere sort of between, uh, was still had a McEwen-esque notion that you know, health wasn't generated by uh, health services, but had a series of recommendations that were about reducing socioeconomic inequality and the importance of, of, of um, intervening at that level, but, but also, uh, uh, especially around childhood uh, health and uh, at very early life healthcare, uh, the importance of uh, health services. So the Black Report appeared and, appeared and was you know, sort of published on a very special date. And one wonders the reasons for uh, Heath's Tory government to publish the why December the 23rd, one does think, was the occupational mortality date, data published. Anyway, uh, Julian says it's not everybody's bedside reading, but it inherits an exciting and honourable tradition of social criticism. I love this. You know, listen to the echoes of Victorian thunder in, taste, in table D4, page 22. So it's, it's wonderful putting the idea of the, 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 the sort of uh, campaigning uh, uh, Victorian social reformer. Uh, putting things in tables, and, th and this showed that, in a way, sort of as uh, heralded by uh, Julian's paper on the inverse care law, there had been a substantial increase in the um, inequalities, socioeconomic inequalities in mortality from the, the 51 to the 61 uh, decennial uh, supplement period, data period. So that was the that was the context uh, in, in, in which it appeared. So I'm going to now move on to the generalization of this notion of inverse care to um, to, to response rates and sort of coverage rates in 
population uh, data collection, including by general practitioners that could form the basis of, of, of treatment, uh, of, 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 of implementing uh, treatment programs. Um, this is a piece that uh, Julian wrote, not very ably assisted by me for uh, a memorial volume on for Archie Cochrane, well, based on the 25th anniversary of uh, effectiveness and efficiency, uh, his book, Effectiveness and Efficiency, that I mentioned uh, earlier. And in this, Julian tells the, the story of the uh, Rondefach surveys that uh, Cochrane and his uh, team carried out, uh, which was, was uh, surveying uh, uh, tuberculosis um, evidence of, uh, of exposure to tuberculosis in uh, two valleys uh, to essentially to form the basis of a study which would say, would, would look at the issue about the extent to which TB influenced the progression of pneumoconiosis to uh, massive pul pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and Ar Archie Cochrane, of course, has became famous for getting you know, high response rates um the reasons that uh, julian discusses the reasons for this uh, in, in the paper uh, this brought back ronnie frankenberg who was the uh, was the education officer for the national union of miners and the work that was done you know making sure uh, that the that the miners unions well, union was on board and the levels of community engagement uh, that was put was um, was put into this work, you know, led to these led to very high response rates towards into the late 90s, 90% of people who would come forward for x-rays. So this was a mass x-ray survey of an, of the entire adult population. So this wasn't a sample study, this was this was looking at the entire population of two uh, valley uh, regions. And um, this is one of this is Julian's um, one of these wonderful uh, cartoons uh, uh, of um, uh, of a, uh, a, a lady in a long leather coat with a motorbike and sidecar driving around her husband, who was well coddled uh, up here in the sidecar. And uh, he was one of the very last people who were was, uh, surveyed, one of the very last respondents who had basically uh, taken to his bed or had been assigned to his bed by his wife when a spot was found on his on, a, on an x-ray uh, during the war. And when he finally was x-rayed for the study, the spot, there was no spot was found. And this was the, this was the very slow rehabilitation uh, that uh, followed on from that. But uh, Julian uh, you know, discusses the sort of the U-shaped nature of responses in surveys. I mean, we're we're used to today, you know, to basically think that surveys consist of healthy volunteers. So, you know, you look at uh, UK Biobank, which is a, is a, it has a 5% response rate, because basically everyone was asked, nearly everyone of the appropriate age. So, you know, so it's a volunteer, you know, the volunteer studies and those studies, as you might imagine, um, you know, are massively skewed by uh, socioeconomic uh, position. Uh, I'm not a, you know, I have absolutely no artistic talent uh, whatsoever, but I'm a participant in UK Biobank and at the Bristol um, Clinic where I trotted along um, to have my Biobank, um, my, my Biobank examination. So Biobank is a study of half a million people. As I say, only 5% of those asked uh, turned up. Uh, and they're in the, they're all sitting in line uh, was just was <laughs> a whole stack of professors from the university because those are the people who are turning up. Some of them looking equally uh, peculiar to um, uh, to the, this, the cartoon here, I must say. But the but in these in these surveys that were getting very close to you know full population uh, data, there, there was there would be a sort of U shape that they, the, you know, the the people who would first come would be people who thought that by joining a serve by um, actually participating in the survey, they might get some useful diagnostic assistance and might, so, so this, the, the, in the 
initial people, the, the people who come first, would have higher rates, and they were looking for some form of uncoverage of reasons for morbidity. And then you would go to a, the, sort of the, the, um, the basin of your U uh, of the lower rates in the, in the people who uh, came later. But then in those that you got right at the end, yet again, you had high, very high, high, high levels of disease in, the, in those who came at the end. And, and uh, at, the, um, at the witness survey that I mentioned already and showed a quote from Julian, at, he was, uh, these, are, the, the, these should be half crowns, but oh, the top ones at the top are half crowns. Uh, he was, um, uh, he disagreed with, the, with, the, um, with the Darcy Hart's uh, story about how they'd handed, they'd given uh, half crowns, uh, uh, half crown, uh, half crowns to each uh, miner who took part in one survey. Um, although it, 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 later it, it turned out to be that that was the case. And Darcy Hart told this story of the MRC sending a bag of half crowns on the train because they'd run out of them for paying for the second um, tuberculin uh, assessment. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and Julian then, of course, as Julian would do, he then went into look in detail into the story and it turned out that this was something that the, the uh, union said that if anyone was paid, then everyone had to be paid. So it wasn't the idea of need to be paid for this, but it was that they were thinking of paying some people, they would have to pay uh, everyone. And uh, uh, Julian contrasts the, um, these Ronda Farc surveys uh, with the Framingham study, the very famous study of heart disease uh, set up in a small town in Massachusetts, in Framingham in 1948, which got about 60%. And of course, it isn't. It isn't going from the, the the thing which is really difficult with response rates is going into the last ten uh, percent or the last twenty percent, um, and said that you know the large differences in methodological rigor. And he also uh, discusses how not only was the response rate uh, lower, but also the quality was of the data was lower because the, the, you could see with the blood pressure data that people were rounding to you know zeros when that was uh, inappropriate massive overrepresentation of zeros um, arose not from differences in professional skill or devotion but from important difference in the social base and historical context of these two studies including the recent birth of the national health service in the united kingdom and persistence of medical trade in the united states and their consequences for medical and mass culture these are important lessons for epidemiological research today and in the future so he realized that epidemiology is really a democratic subject, that high response rates means one man, one vote, everybody in the community is important. We need everybody's blood pressure, not just the blood pressures of people who've come along to see you about their blood pressure or have, coron or have coronaries, we need the whole distribution. And that the wonderful discovery by George Pickering that blood pressure was continuously disputed, so we didn't have to label people as having a disease or not having them, but could interest ourselves in how much they had and whether it was useful to call high blood pressure a disease. So de-deifying disease, getting distributions and combinations of distributions was a new thing. I could see straight away that the debate between Pickering and Platt wasn't a scientific debate, it was a social debate about how we consider uh, normality and uh, abnormality. And of course, Julian went on to uh, complete the first uh, complete the first entire population survey of uh, blood pressure uh, in, a, in his community in uh, Glencorrig. And uh, in this, reflecting his remarks about the uh, poor quality of the Framingham blood pressure data, uh, uh, he used, oh, sorry, it's meant to be that way around. He used Geoffrey Rose's uh, sphygma manometer for epidemiologists, a, a sphygma manometer, that random zero. Sphygma manometer enabling um, non uh, uh, enabling you not to get um, these uh, digit uh, preferences and uh, not to look for something like 120, uh, you know, um, level because you don't want to report something higher than that when it's you know thought to be uh, hypertensive. And uh, Jeffrey Rose, uh, who was a the um, leading 20th century British epidemiologist, a professor at the School of Hygiene, and introduced this notion about that you should think about sick populations, not about sick individuals and the importance of distributions who had been Pickering's uh, house surgeon. And I went to see Geoffrey Rose actually quite soon after seeing, after I'd met Julian, 
to see if I could uh, possibly get onto his epidemiology course at the London School of Hygiene. And he told me I had to go away and <laughs> train and do some more medicine, clinical medicine and uh, get my MRCP before I could dream of uh, becoming a, an epidemiologist. And I think I think this focus on uh, quality here's the, the nice story that Julian tells of the dodgy hemo, hemoglobinometer at the witness seminar in, in the Glencoric population. He was uh, measuring uh, uh, hemoglobin levels and he took these data to Peter Elwood who, who had taken over from Archie Cochran as head of the, oh no, that was before Peter had taken over, he was working for Archie Cochran and doing anemia surveys, anemia studies. And uh, Peter had been a bit sniffy about them and said, you know, have you weighed menstrual blood uh, to know why that, you know, what the reasons may be, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that, you know, have you done, uh, you know, repeats and quality control checks and went away and looked at this and then turned out that the uh, data uh, they've been collected uh, were uh, worthless, uh, but the so but the importance of collecting, you've got to get a lot of people or as many of the people as you can, but also uh, the, the quality of data. And uh, I love this from uh, uh, Julia said, you know, a fair rule of thumb for who should or should not qualify as a co-author of a research paper is competence to give. An interesting lecture on an important aspect of the work performed to a peer audience. Strictly, apply, strictly applied, this might leave too many published papers without any authors at all, but it would not have excluded any of Archie's field workers. And here he's writing about the fact that Archie Cochran, you know, included field workers and, and people with, uh, without technical uh, qualifications as co-authors, which wasn't done as a generality and has never still, you know, isn't done as a generality. In uh, academic uh, in academic work, and I was thinking about that with uh, Mary and Julian did this extraordinary sort of piloting work for the uh, warfarin trial. This is a trial Tom Mead ran, uh, where you're giving rat poison essentially to uh, people to uh, reduce thrombosis risk, and it was a trial that showed that this did indeed work. But probably the, 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 it was so hard to monitor warfarin. Um, uh, so that uh, never, it's never, it hasn't been introduced as a, as a therapy, but we're doing all this extraordinary work. People are not uh, authors uh, on the publications, including the pilot study. So, um, uh, so the one thing I, I the, the quote about the, the rule of thumb, and I, I mentioned, um, uh, but also I mentioned, you know, Julian's great writing skill. And, you know, one thing he, uh, you know, said is that. You know, you know, he just he wasn't a sub, you know, didn't point score that you, you had to write in an accessible style. The only point scoring that was allowed was when you had someone who was nominally a co-author. And this, <laughs> so this, in this paper on response rates, he talks about the original random fact studies used the whole population rather than random samples. No way field workers could make life easier by knocking at number 56, process terrorists, if they'd had a refusal at 55, thus systematically biasing data away from difficult people or people with difficulties. This eliminated a major source of error for researchers tempted to rely on market research agencies instead of developing, maintaining, and paying for their own field teams. As experience of the Heartbeat Wales questionnaire survey showed, such agencies not only produce results of poor quality, but hopeless response rates around 60%. And as I mentioned, I went to South Wales to work on the Heartbeat Wales <laughs> surveys. And that's when I met uh, uh, Julian. Um, and I was a co author, or an undeserved co author. On this. Uh, paper. And here are the, uh, here's the response rates in these Glencoreg surveys, including, you know, studies that, that people, where people have to be willing to be randomised to rat poison, uh, you know, getting 87% response rates, so these in, in, incredibly high response rates. So finally, um, risk. So, you know, possibly the most important indicator of whether medical care is going to have benefits is if you're at high if you're at high high risk for the outcome if you're at low risk for the outcome then a, a really small adverse consequence of the treatment uh, could outweigh any possible benefits and here Julian agreed with uh, Jeffrey Rose who, uh, who made the, 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 the same point uh, and uh, worried a lot about the cholesterol lowering drugs um, that the, the early cholesterol lowering drugs, the pre statin cholesterol lowering drugs, 
the, the most used of which was clofibrate, which was registered to be used as uh, a uh, as a procarcinogen in animal studies. So the drug that was given to humans in animal studies, when you tried to induce cancer, it would give clofibrate to help uh, to help in that task. Uh, wasn't a drug that. Uh, Julian would take, even though he had high cholesterol, he wouldn't take cholestyramine, which was horrible. I have hypercholesterolemia too. And uh, uh, but, but when the statins came around, uh, he, he, he and the data changed. Then, as you would, uh, you would and the data changed because the drug had changed and has very, very minimal of any side effects. Uh, the, the balance changes. But the important thing is that people who have the most to gain uh, from, say, a twenty percent reduction in risk are those at the highest risk. Uh, and he loved, uh, uh, was really, um, it was really important that he, he pointed this out, uh, showing how one of, the US, one of the trials in the US, which was ostensibly a trial of lowering blood pressure, was actually a trial of some form of free healthcare, because this was a trial done in low income populations in the US with a very high uh, African American uh, proportion, people who were not receiving adequate healthcare of any sort, uh, and the and the trial ostensibly was to sort of search out, you know, was to actually get a, a, a group to provide to provide antihypertensive treatment, which was the main treatment that was given. But it wasn't a blinded trial, and the um, the form of healthcare uh, given would have would found, find other things, and that the, the mortality from non cardiovascular causes decreased was decreased in the in the, the group randomised to the intervention, which meant healthcare, than it was in the in the in the group who were just sort of um, sent back to usual care, which in the US meant care that you could have you, know, you could pay for in, uh, often. And so uh, and, and so this he and uh, he. Uh, compared this trial to his obviously non-randomized uh, comparison uh, of, um, uh, of the outcomes in Glencorog and in a neighboring um, uh, practice, which uh, Graham Watt talked about last week and others have discussed when there was lower, uh, appeared to be lower mortality occurring across the board in Glencorog. So this is when you've got populations at high risk, then those populations uh, have more to gain. And, and he thought that the, the, um, the ostensibly um, similar trial to the, uh, the hypertension detection and follow-up program in the US, the UK version was the MRC trial of treatment of mild hypertension run by Julian's erstwhile uh, colleague at the MRC unit, Bill Mile. Um, and I remember going to the, in 1985, one of the first sort of uh, such events I've been to, the presentation, the unveiling of these results before publication, and it was quite, they were very disappointing. Um, and, the, and they were ostensibly treating the same level of blood pressure in, uh, as the UK, as the US trial, but the notion was that these, if you looked at the actual mortality rates, you know, the people selected for having relatively high blood pressure, have much lower mortality rates than the overall population because of the sorts of people who get into trials. So this, you know, so, so the, 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 the inverse care law, that the, um, uh, those notions apply to how you should think about designing uh, studies. Uh, I, uh, Julian has, you know, summed up uh, his, uh, the, the, you know, the implications of the inverse care law and how, how his whole, you know, career of following that fed into looking at ways you could, how you could deal with this uh, with his um, book, um, in, the, in his two brilliant books. I mean, I think the second one is a masterpiece that people should read. The first one was um, Feasible Socialism. And I received a copy of, uh, my, it's my copy of Feasible Socialism that I received through the post from the BMJ with a letter, uh, this is in 1994, a letter saying, I'm reliably informed by the author that you will review this book for the BMJ. So that was then they'd sent to me and I duly, of course, did review the book. But the, the BMJ used to pay you in those days and get a hundred quid. And uh, until for about 20 years in my office, this was stuck on the wall because it, because it came like a sort of invoice and it looked like that uh, the, the, so the BMJ would deliver feasible socialism for, you know, for a hundred quid, but, which would be a real deal. But um, 
so that was his first and then this was massively expanded um, into a book called the political economy of healthcare uh, in a series that mary shaw and i were the, were the editors uh, for and it, uh, the, the book had this quote from uh, an Aaron bevin at the beginning uh, was the debate in 48 in the commons uh, I think it's a sad reflection that this great act, the NHS Act, to which every party has made its contribution, in which every section of the community is vitally interested, should have so stormy a birth. I should have thought, and we all hoped, that the doctors would have realised that we are setting their feet on a new path entirely, that we ought to take pride in the fact that despite our financial and economic anxieties, we are still able to do the most civilised thing in the world, to put the welfare of the, the sick in front of every other consideration. And of course, feasible socialism was saying that you know, the NHS was like prefiguring how uh, cooperative socialist societies would organize how uh, a mutual uh, care. And, uh, um, and uh, Julian's The Political Economy of Health, uh, as uh, uh, health, the Political Economy of Healthcare book, uh, took this forward. And uh, in the book, Julian said, My original title for this book was A New Path Entirely from the passage in Bevan's speech quoted earlier, because it provides a connecting thread throughout my argument. My editors, so that was Mary and me, thought this would be incomprehensible to most of the people, otherwise likely to be interested in reading it. So I bowed to, to their view, a new title is probably better. And uh, uh, Jonathan uh, said in the talk two weeks ago about how he wished feasible socialism hadn't been called feasible socialism because it he thinks it reduced him, his ability to get his colleagues um, to, to, to read it. And so I guess what when the second, uh, I guess what should have been done with the political economy of uh, healthcare was uh, you know, we, we should, should have brought out uh, two different versions, one called the political economy of healthcare and one called the new path into entirely and seen which should solve better. And uh, Julian's grudging line was the new title is probably better, although he, he, <laughs> he kept telling me, that wasn't what he ever said to me. He was very, he, I was told off for having suggested, you know, for, for having you know, forced him into this uh, tiger. Uh, those, are, those are beautiful the cartoons that took about three minutes for Julian, a few minutes for Julian to draw my kids when they were small, which uh, on, they still have on their uh, walls. Uh, and um, uh, I was going to finish with a quote from Temkin, which I know Julian liked, which is, there's no science of the individual and medicine suffers from a fundamental contradiction. Its practice deals with the individual, while its theory grasps universals only. And of course, with, you know, with inequalities, with the notion of inverse care, well, we can only really say that at the level of groups and forms of groups. And so, and all your treatment evidence comes from trials which are based on groups. But the person you see or you sit next to, as Graham said, you know, Julian said, you know, face to face and then side by side, the person who sits next to is an individual. And that is the that is the greatest uh, um, issue, I guess, in thinking about how population health, uh, epidemiology and uh, clinical medicine uh, uh, come together. And uh, uh, as uh, I, 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 in doing this, I discovered there's a, this 20 page interview with uh, Mary, uh, Mary and Julian, uh, which is transcribed uh, on the um, acute tweet that was on the Queen Mary uh, research group, the study of history of medicine, uh, history of modern biomedicine. Andy Ness did the interview Julian and Mary, and the interview is uh, up for people who want to uh, read a lot more about, um, especially about uh, Julian as uh, a sort of what Julian in his period of learning um, epidemiology. And that was my discussion point. Anyway, I'll stop. Sorry, I've gone on too long, I realise. Thanks. No, you haven't at all, uh, George. That was absolutely fascinating. And thank, thank you ever so much and, and for all the uh, uh, large number of slides. I wonder if people um, have got any questions or comments uh, for George. And if you have, perhaps you can unmute uh, and ask. Maybe while you're thinking, perhaps I can ask one, George. Uh, the question of a whole population studies, uh, which Julian um, pioneered using his own practice in, in Coral. Uh, this is a really innocent and, uh, and silly question, I know, but how often has that been done since Julian? That's a, yeah, that's an interesting idea, which I'm now, I, I don't know. Re reflecting my ivory tower isolation, I'm, I'm, uh, I actually, um, uh, 
don't know how, I mean, I think in, in, in general practices, I mean, what, what the, the, the attempt was made, of course, that you know, the general practice, that reimbursement would change with, you know, uh, the, the, the GP, the practice would get, re would get reimbursement for going over certain levels, like having got, you know, a smoking history on 80%, you know, you know there's was, there was, there was people here who will know much better than I do the history of the changing uh, roles of those reimbursements. I mean, at one stage, famously, reimbursement was uh, introduced uh, for people you know, um, for early detection of uh, incipient dementia. And you know, demonstrating <laughs> absolutely Julian's point about, you, know, you, know, you get the wrong sort of data if you pay, the, the problems of marketization. There was a 50% increase in detected early dementia when general GPs were paid to detect early dementia. There, was no, there wasn't any real, obviously there was no real increase in disease. So, so epidemiologists can't use that period, of, that, that period of data because it was just suddenly influenced by this uh, you know, external change in, in reward. Um, so so I, mean, the, the, I mean, there's definitely attempts, I mean, you know, because of Julian's uh, work and, and you know, the, the, that it was worth detecting Blood pressure and treatments, you know, and, and, and treating, and now it's worth detecting cardiovascular risk. And uh, Julian, again, I didn't have time to go into this. Was one of the people who shifted the idea for from treating on the basis of a risk factor to treating on the basis of overall cardiovascular risk. Because if you give someone a statin, it reduces their risk of having a heart attack from twenty by twenty percent. But that 20% is obviously vastly more in absolute terms if you've got a sort of 60-year-old smoker with angina than it is if you've got, you know, a 60-year-old athlete, you know, you know skinny, non-smoking athlete. So, so you should actually consider the, the overall level of risk of patients rather than considering just their risk factor. You shouldn't just treat on blood pressure or on cholesterol level. You should treat on the overall level of risk because you get the same sort of percentage decrease in that risk and it's and its absolute uh, level is much greater for those at uh, um, at a high, you know, at higher risk. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Robert, Scott your hand up. Uh, thank you for making such a, a complex uh, subject uh, understandable and interesting. Um, does access to uh, medical services have a significant effect on the inverse uh, care law? Oh, sorry, access to medical services. Um, I mean, I think yeah, you know, no. I, so I think dramatically. So I mean, probably two things I, I I sort of meant to say at the end, but then I got I rushed past was that. Uh, I mean, the one thing that changed with the context, and I, I didn't mean to say this and didn't say it, so thanks for the question, you know, is, is, is that, um, uh, and the, is that, you know, the notion that um, the major drivers of, of population health were medical, wasn't medical care that we could put forward was right for, for, for the period, or at least to a re reasonable extent uh, was true about the period leading to that. The truth is that, uh, that there has been a transformation in the in the ability to actually you know to to you know to reduce future disease in the cardiovascular field because of um, it, because of you know, blood pressure lowering and uh, cholesterol lowering drugs because of the uh, dramatic beneficial effects of um, post myocardial infarction uh, treatments uh, that, uh, that exist. I mean, when I was a you know a house you know junior hospital doctor. Someone had a heart attack. You gave them heroin and put them to bed. Whereas now, I mean, the, the actual, you know, the therapeutic, the therapeutics available post MI have dramatic effects. So, so medical care has a, you know, has a has a much has a really major uh, contribution to uh, population morbidity and mortality and uh, and access um, to care, um, you know, to care influences that. I was also going to say the other thing I said at the end was that. Um, uh, about, three, th about many decades after I first met him, Julian did, actually, did say to me after he did get to him, after, <laughs> he did say to me that, uh, that he, he, he thought he'd make an exception that that uh, uh, I was someone that it was it was good for the patients that I actually hadn't gone into doing uh, into doing clinical medicine. So he, he, uh, 
you had an astute assessment of, uh, of um, people's abilities. It's true. It's, um, it's true. Thank you. I've uh, got time for another one if anybody would like to ask. I can't see anybody waiting. Well, I think perhaps we should let you off the hook, uh, George. You've given us uh, high yes. value for your uh, hour and hour and ten minutes almost. Uh, so <laughs> thank you ever so much. I'm, I'm not going Pleasure. to talk for long about uh, to thank you, but I'd just like to say a couple of things, really. Uh, one is uh, thank you for putting Julian and his work, and particularly the inverse care law, into um, perspective and into context. It was really interesting to hear about uh, the other kind of pro progressive thinkers who influenced him and were around at the time and slightly afterwards. Um, that was all incredibly interesting and different from what the previous uh, speakers have given us. And uh, also um, the information about the, the medical uh, epidemiological context of 1971 in, in relation to trends in um, mortality. Uh, really very, very interesting. Uh, th the other thing that struck me um, throughout what you said uh, was what a communicator Julian was, particularly on paper. Uh, what a brilliant use of language. And I wonder whether some of his influence and his success was uh, in small part at least, um, uh, owing to that brilliant use of, of language. And you gave us several of them actually. Listen um, to the echoes of Victorian thunder in table yeah. D4. Oh, yeah. oh, what a sentence that is. Yeah. Um, or D deifying disease. Uh, not many people, uh, not many people, even in medicine, can come up with uh, with words like that in that kind of order. I'm sure uh, it must have had a huge effect on people's people who were reading him and listening uh, to him at the time. Um, thanks too for uh, taking us through the, the whole question of response rates and risk. That that was really really interesting, and. Um, uh, the work that was done by Julian and Mary in Glyn uh, was really based on a quite new and, and um, revolutionary way of approaching uh, how to study populations uh, and their uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, and just to sum up, really, to sum up not only your talk, but the whole of the series, um, what you've all between you shown is what a visionary uh, Julian Tudor Hart was. Well, well ahead of his time in many, many respects. But he wasn't just a, a visionary or an idealist. He was a, an idealist who was practical and rigorous uh, and determined um, to do all the, all the things right uh, in his research and his practice. Um, I did wonder when you mentioned an Aaron Bevan's phrase, um, a new path entirely, uh, which was used, he used about the birth of the NHS in 1948, whether that would be a good phrase actually for Julian's whole career, uh, a new path entirely. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, the influence that he's had uh, since is clearly enormous. So thank you, George, uh, for uh, everything. Uh, thank you for your talk. And thank you to uh, all the speakers actually in this really, really worthwhile uh, series. And um, I hope your talk will be up on uh, YouTube for a lot more people to look at um, within the next day or two. Great. Thanks a lot. And thanks people for coming along. <laughs>